Uh, before I get going, same disclaimer. I'm, most of this is from memory. I have looked some stuff up today just to make sure that I, that I get it right. Uh, but we'll be talking about the cap capturing experiment, what it means, why it's interesting. And uh, so let's go ahead and get started. Let me pull up the Katrin experiment, the famous picture that I show fairly regularly on this stream. Uh, images, I want the image. This one right here, this is like one of the most famous images ever in the history of ever for the Katrin experiment. And of course it didn't open up the image. Here's the image, that's what I wanted. So this is the Katrin experiment. This is the mass spectrometer from the Katrin experiment. Uh, and the size of the spectrometer was limited by these houses. Um, at least that's my understanding. Uh, they needed to make this thing as big as they could. It's extremely high precision measurements. Um, it's also the type of steel that they used. There are only a few places in the world that can manufacture this type of steel. And, uh, or like, so it's a steel that has low contamination from radioactive sources, which is important because of the type of, type of measurement that they're doing. And so they needed to make it as big as they could and they needed to, uh, but it needed to be able to be transported from the place where it's manufactured to the place where the experiment is stored. And it is in Germany, so it's possible that this is a gigantic beer keg or that it might be used for a beer keg at some point in the future. But for now, it is just a mass spectrometer for electrons. Uh, the location uh, where it was manufactured and the location where it was actually delivered are not that far apart from each other. They're both in Germany. One is in uh, Bavaria and the other one is in Karlsruhe, which I think is in the Rhineland area. Um, but I, we have to show the map because the map is really important at some place around here. Um, I think this shows the map. Here's the map. Okay, so uh, image in a new tab. So it started right here near Stuttgart and they couldn't just drive it across the country because it's a bit big and they have fixed infrastructure that's hard to navigate around. Um, you have this big thing, you can't take it apart um, because otherwise they'd have to basically reassemble it at the, at the distant location, which means that they'd have to take all the instrumentation and rebuild the instrumentation. So you can't just drive it, it's too bumpy. Um, too many things are in the way. You can't send it in, frac in chunks and then do it over there because metrology, like being able to measure all the component parts, is uh, another challenge that needs to be faced. And so, you know, you build a manufacturing plant around your ability to make measurements. Like we make precision stuff. We have precision measuring devices in order to do this precision stuff. And it took cost us a few billion dollars to build up our factory you're not just gonna transplant it to some other location. So to save money um, without having to basically build it on site and instrument uh, the fabrication location or you know the, the university, they built it in the, lab, or in the factory here and then they sent it down the Danube River, down all the way down the Danube River to uh, the Black Sea around the Mediterranean on a barge up the Rhine River from Rotterdam up the Rhine River to Karlsruhe, which is right on the corner of France, like this little wedge of France that sticks into Germany. Karlsruhe is right on the corner of that. This is the area where in the Franco-Prussian War, the Germans came storming across the border, or they kind of baited the French into attacking across the border, then they stormed across the border. Um, anyway, so this is all Franco-Prussian War area, uh, the Alsace-Lorraine area, and Karlsruhe is right there on the apex of this little triangle. So that's where they sent it, and it was, basically getting this instrument uh, into place. So that is pretty cool. Uh, what was I gonna say? That was the design. Um, you can see that in some places they had to get it under certain bridges that were there. Uh, so it says here that they had to add a bunch of weight to the barge to have it sink down low enough to where they could get some clearance. Hopefully that wasn't very windy that day. Uh, apparently they had seven centimeters. Seven centimeters is about, about yay big seven centimeters of clearance um, between the top of this very expensive piece of machinery and uh, and the bridge right here. And there was another bridge a little bit later on. Here it is uh, being sailed around the ocean. And then eventually they get it into town. Here's that picture that we were just looking at. 
uh, they had to drive, I guess, seven kilometers or something like that um, from the Rhine River to the to the institute where they housed it, lift it up on a crane, put it into place. There you go. All right, now, how the Katrin experiment works. That is a good question. Well, let's talk about it. Well, before we talk about the Katrin experiment, we need to understand like why we care about these neutrinos. So it was discovered in the 1990s. It was assumed for quite a while before then, but it was finally discovered in the 1990s that neutrinos actually have mass. Uh, and there are three different types of neutrinos. We knew that there were three different types of neutrinos, and we know that those neutrinos have some mass, okay? And that's from the 1990s. So the uh, question is, when you make these neutrino oscillation experiments, so when you have experiments like uh, the Super Kamiokanda experiment, Super K, that was the atmospheric neutrino measurements. We had the Sudbury Neutrino Observatory that made its measurements. There's other neutrino oscillation measurements that are done like LSMB, although that was a they had results that were a little bit unusual. So let's erase that one and come back to that one a little bit later. Um, there's uh, NOVA, there's DUNE right now that they're putting together. You have MINOS. Um, so there's, and this is like only a small number of the neutrino experiments. Neutrino experiments all over the place in order. And one of the things that they do is try to measure these, um, the properties of the neutrinos. And one of the things that you get out of the measurements from each of these things is called the mass differences. So we have three different neutrinos, uh, three different neutrino masses, uh, M1, M2, and M3. These are not necessarily directly related to the neutrino flavor states, like the electron flavor state and the muon flavor and the tau flavor, um, because the electron neutrino is actually a combination of these mass states, as is the muon neutrino. It's a combination of the mass states, and the tau neutrino is also a combination of the mass states. So these aren't, they don't, there's no one-to-one -one correspondence between them. They're all mixed together, and they're mixed together through a mathematical structure called the mixing matrix, which is just a matrix that tells you how much of um, how much of each of these things do you piece together in order to get an electron neutrino. To get an electron neutrino, you have to add these three things together in certain ratios. And the mixing matrix tells you what are the ratios that uh, these combine to give you an electron neutrino. But that's beside the point right now. Right now, the point is that there are these three different masses, and we want to understand um, the behavior that you get in these neutrino experiments, like looking for neutrino oscillations, you don't actually get these masses directly. Instead, what you get is m2 squared minus m1 squared, something like this. Okay, Or you'll get m3 squared uh, minus m2 squared. So uh, they call these things like the mass squared difference. They call them like delta m squared. Delta m squared would be this quantity. And so you don't get you only get the differences. You don't actually get the absolute value. So these masses could be a kilogram. They're not a kilogram, but you could imagine them being a kilogram and only have these small mass differences. So these mass differences that have been measured, they do put a lower limit on the minimum mass that the neutrinos can have. So the mass differences that we measure, delta M squared, like, like it's delta M like one, two squared and delta M two, three. I think these are the ones that are used most often. Um, these are both similar in size. There's something on the order of like 50 milli electron volts as the mass differences. I think one of them might be a little bit less than that, the other one a little bit more than that. They, they're not exactly the same, but they're in this milli electron volt range. Um, and so uh, there are two differences. There's a small difference and there's a big difference. So I don't recall exactly which one is which. I think this is M12. And this is, so this is M12 squared, uh, delta M12 squared. And I think this is delta M23 squared, the big difference. And so we don't know the minimum mass, or uh, sorry, we do know the minimum mass. The minimum mass you get from saying, let's assume that one of them, whatever, let's, I guess we'll call it M1, has a mass equal to zero. So if M1 has a mass equal to zero, then you can get M2 from this ratio, and then you can get M mass three from that ratio or from this expression and from that expression. So, but we don't know what the minimum mass is. If we could measure the mass of the lightest one of them, or even the heaviest one of them, then we can fill in the rest of this gap. However, there's a question, and this question is related to um, which one is which? Which one goes on top, which one goes on the bottom? If there is a lowest mass one, is M1 really the lowest mass, or is M3 the lowest mass, or is M2 the lowest mass? We don't know the answer to this question. We don't know which one has the smallest mass. So you have two different possibilities that have not been 
that are competing for our affection or the affection of the universe. And that is what's called the normal hierarchy, normal hierarchy, or it's also called the normal order, normal order. Uh, and that looks like this, where you have the masses stacked like this. You have, I, I believe it's M12, and then this is M23, like this, um, squared. So they're either stacked like that, or you have what's called the inverted hierarchy, or the inverted order, where it's the big ones on the bottom. So the lowest mass thing is down here, the highest mass object is up there. The inverted hierarchy looks like this, where the lowest mass one is down here, and then the highest mass one is up here. The reason that this is the normal hierarchy is listed that way and the inverted hierarchy is listed that way is that when you look at the quarks, the quarks are um, the differences in mass between the up quark and the down quark is relatively small. The difference in mass between the bottom quark and the top quark, which is the last two set of quarks, is really big. So in the quark area, um, the lowest mass things are closer together and the higher mass things are farther apart. And so that's why they call this the normal hierarchy. The inverted hierarchy is just saying there's no, there's no necessarily, there, there isn't necessarily a reason why the neutrinos would behave the same way that the quarks do. And so you could have something that's inverted. It's just we're already familiar with this type of hierarchy. And so we call the other one the inverted hierarchy. Um, do we know how the force neutrinos assume is different? Do we know how to force neutrinos to assume the different eigenstates? Uh, we can't, I don't know that you can force them to, to exist in different mass eigenstates. You can only force them to go into certain flavor eigenstates because uh, flavor eigenstates are related to the couplings that they have. So neutrinos, a neutrino has, it made up, maybe you have an electron neutrino. Uh, that electron neutrino is actually, you know, some amount of nu1 plus some amount of nu2 plus some amount of nu3, right? These are the mass states right here. But when you make a detector, you make a detector out of electrons. And so it's going to be sensitive to electron type neutrinos. And so you can only really force neutrinos. If you made a detector out of muons, then you could make it into a muon eigenstate. But the way that neutrinos interact with the nucleus through the W and through the Z, um, so you have like a neutrino comes in, interacts with this to, like it's the W or the Z that couples it to the protons uh, of your detector. Um, these interact with flavors, not with masses. So they interact with electron neutrinos, they interact with muon neutrinos or tau neutrinos, they don't interact with the individual eigenstates. Those mass eigenstates only are related to how the neutrino propagates through, through space. Okay, so there are two questions that we have now seen. Question number one is what, uh, where's my thing, here we go. What uh, order? Do we have an inverted hierarchy or do we have a regular, a normal hierarchy? And so question number one, what order? Question number two is, what is the mass? Okay, we, we need to measure the lowest mass or honestly, any mass would help uh, distinguish this, but we need to understand, we need to know what is the actual mass scale. We know what the differences are between the neutrinos, but we don't know if those differences are like this, like here's the mass, and then we have the different um, mass differences up here like this, or if it's we have you know some mass down here and then the mass differences like we don't know if the if we were to line these three masses up side by side if we get something like this or if we get something like this okay so this is like 10 times taller than this one so is the mass scale we, I mentioned already that the differences here are milli EV scale so that's a millionth of an electron volt scale uh, where the just for an example, an electron, an electron mass is 511, like 500 keV. Okay, so that's like um, 500,000 electron volts, and this is one one thousandth of one electron volts. So the mass of the electron is almost a billion times, right? This is almost a million, and this is um, the mass of the electron is almost a billion times bigger than the differences in the masses between the neutrinos. The different neutrino flavors and we don't know if um, the absolute neutrino mass maybe it's one keV we know that it's not one keV but you could imagine it being a keV with tiny little differences um, so the differences are basically look how much frosting you applied to the end of them uh, or if the differences are actually similar to the actual masses such that um, you know maybe the lowest mass is also around the milli eV scale and then the differences are similar to the actual mass it's like the difference between um, 
masses of cars is comparable to the mass of a car. You have a small car that might be a half a ton, you have a big car that might be one and a half tons, and now you've got a one ton difference between cars that are basically a ton apiece. So we don't know uh, the absolute scale, like how big is the actual masses of these things? We only know the mass differences. So what's the mass scale? That's a question we need to ask. And what order are the masses? So these are the, uh, now this is, it's not an electronics lecture because this is not a, an electron volt. KeV like this is not the same thing as a KV, a kilovolt. So those are not, these are two different, two different things. Uh, one's an energy and the other one is an electric potential. Okay, now, how does Katrin, how is Katrin going to resolve all this for us? How is it going to solve these problems? Well, the way that Katrin is designed, um, or, okay, before I go on to that, let me first talk about, we do have some limits on the masses of neutrinos. Uh, we can get limits from cosmology, from the behavior of the early universe on what the limits, like how massive these neutrinos could actually be. Because if you have neutrinos that have a large mass, then you get different behaviors. So in the very early universe, if you have a particle, okay, so here's a particle, and here's another particle, and here's another particle. And as the universe expands, these things are moving out in a variety of different directions. They have some energy. Um, these particles are going to have some kinetic energy associated with them, and then the universe is also going to be expanding. So there's an energy density of the universe, which is basically how much energy do you have in a given volume. This is an E, by the way. It might look like the pound symbol, but it's the letter E. Um, so you have these objects, they have some energy in some volume, and that gives you a, an energy density. Uh, energy density, which would be, you know, whatever it is. Okay? And as the universe expands, the volume is increasing. And that says that when you have a bunch of particles in here, that the energy density, uh, which is given by omega, the energy density squiggles one over the size cubed, okay? Because you have some volume, volume, you know, you have some size here, here's your box, as these dimensions are, and as the universe gets bigger, the size of that box gets bigger, the particles spread out, and the energy density goes down as the box grows. However, if you have radiation ob uh, objects that are moving relativistically, objects that are moving very rapidly, then you also have to account for the fact that they have a quantum wavelength associated with them. And quantum wavelengths um, are also related to the energy. So you have like a photon, for example. Photon uh, has a wavelength like this. The energy of a photon is proportional to one over the wavelength. It's proportional to the frequency, which is one over the wavelength. And so if you have a bunch of photons uh, where the quantum wavelength is important, then as the universe spreads apart, not only do the photons spread apart, but the photons also stretch out. So not only do you spread them apart, but they themselves get spread farther and farther apart. The wavelength expands, which means that the energy of the photons goes down. So the density of the photons go down and the energy of the individual photons also go down with the wavelength, which means that the energy density of radiation, so this is like matter, so this is particles, but if you have something that's moving relativistically such that the wavelength, its quantum wavelength is important, then you're, then you're not talking about matter anymore, you're talking about what, well, <clears throat> what cosmologists would call radiation. And omega radiation, uh, where am I gonna put this? I guess I'll put it right down here. Omega, uh, that's an omega, it didn't look like it. Omega radiation squiggles one over r to the fourth, okay? It's three dimensions because it's spreading out in space and one extra factor of r because you're stretching out the wavelength as the box grows. So you can go back to the early universe and look how things are expanding, and in particular look at how the energy density is falling off. And if the energy density falls off very rapidly, then that limits certain kinds of physical processes that can go on. Uh, they won't happen as long because the energy is changing too fast. And so if you have a lot of particles in the early universe that are relativistic, then the energy density changes like this. If you have a bunch of particles in the early universe that are not relativistic, then the energy density of the universe changes like that. And so we can go back in the early universe, we understand how these particles all interact with each other, and we can constrain from our measurements of the cosmic microwave background radiation and from Big Bang nucleosynthesis, we can constrain the amount of radiation, that radiation means relativistic particles, we can constrain the number of relativistic particles that existed in the early universe, and as a consequence constrain the variety of neutrinos, um, like how many neutrinos there might be, 
and what the masses of those neutri neutrinos might also be uh, by looking at this kind of behavior in the early universe. So, uh, so there are some constraints that come from cosmology on the overall scale of the um, mass of the neutrinos. I believe that right now this, these kinds of observations of the early universe constrain the mass of the neutrino, the mass of the lowest neutrino, to be, or I'm sorry, it's constraining the total mass of the neutrinos. That's usually, I think, how the measurements are described. The total mass of the neutrino, I think, from cosmology is something like one electron volt. Okay, so that basically says that if you add all the masses of the neutrinos together, you can't be higher than basically one electron volt, which is one one thousandth of the distant difference, or maybe like one one hundredth of the difference between their masses themselves. So uh, we don't. All this is a constraint on the total mass. It is not a measurement of any of the individual masses. So we don't know. We still don't know, even from these measurements, if it's one electron volt with milli electron volt differences, like a one of electron volt scale with milli electron volt differences in the heights, or if it's still milli electron volt scale and milli electron volt differences or anything in between. So there's still a factor of a thousand that we want to penetrate in our sensitivity to these kinds of things. This is where Katrin uh, enters the fray. So let's take a look at the Katrin experimental device. Uh, these are not them, so let me see if I can pull up um, the Katrin, uh, Katrin experiment and get a whole cross section. Okay, because it looks like a it looks like a lollipop. All things considered, a big long lollipop. Here we go. Here is the big Katrin lollipop. Uh, hold on, that's. I want to pull it up in this browser because then I can expand the image as I see fit. Okay, this is the Katrin lollipop. <clears throat> the big mass spectrometer, we'll go into the physics of that in a little bit. That is this area right here. And then you have a bunch of other things that are in the middle. Um, all of these different parts are to prepare the beam and calibrate it and eliminate systematic effects and stuff like that. Um, and then the mass spectrometer, that's the, that's the business end. <laughs> So what they use for Katrin, so Katrin is Karlsruhe uh, tritium something. I don't know what the N stands for. Uh, C-A-T, or C-A is Karlsruhe, T-R-I is tritium, and N is for something. What, maybe it's neutrinos. <clears throat> so the, they're using tritium. The reason they want to use tritium is because tritium is, uh, well, Katrin, it's one of the lowest energy beta decays that you can have. So a beta decay is basically you have a neutron. This is a neutron. The neutron will beta decay uh, by basically emitting, what's it going to emit? Uh, it's probably going to emit a Z. And then it's going to split into, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, okay, I need to draw this slightly differently. Okay, well, we'll just do it like this. It's going to come along. It is going to... Uh, spontaneously split into a proton, an electron, and a neutrino. Okay, it's electron antineutrino. Okay, so the, neut the neutron is going to come along and split, and they call it beta decay because this particle right here, that electron is called a beta particle. Um, an alpha particle is a helium nucleus with um, two protons and two neutrons. Uh, that's an alpha. A beta is an electron or a positron, E plus. These are beta. Part, so this is alpha particles, beta particles, and gammas are basically photons. So gammas are gammas. They're just high energy gammas um, in nuclear physics. So now the way this actually is working is that deep inside the nucleus you have, or deep inside the neutron, you have three quarks. So you have, um, the way that they would typically draw this is you would have a neutron's a dud, right? So you'd have a down, up, down. Like this, this would come along and spontaneously emit, uh, I assume it's a Z, maybe it's a W, Z or W. Um, the up would continue, this would continue, this would spontaneously then be changed. The emission of the Z 
is a flavor changing thing that changes this to an up. So you'd have up, up, down. And then this will decay, the Z or W will decay into an electron and a uh, neutrino. Okay, I'm, I'm pretty sure it's got to be a Z, but there might be some loop in here that you could add that changes things. Anyway, the point being that you emit an intermediate vector boson uh, that does this weak decay. This is a, these three quarks here, that is a neutron. These three quarks here, that is a proton. And uh, then you get this electron and, and electron antineutrino. So that is the decay that you're actually looking at. The reason that you want to use tritium, tritium has is unstable. So it's a form of hydrogen. You have regular hydrogen that looks like this with a proton and an electron. You have deuterium, which is a proton, and deuterium is stable. That's stable forever. And we saw from one of our earlier streams that a deuterium is a way that you can constrain the overall density of matter in the universe by the amount of deuterium, because this is all created in the early universe. Um, so this is stable. Uh, regular hydrogen is stable. That says stable, by the way. Stable. Uh, this is also stable. Uh, however, tritium, which is a proton and two neutrons, like this, this is unstable. That says unstable. Okay, so tritium is unstable. It will spontaneously decay, spit out this um, electron. The neutrino that we care about, uh, we care about, but only in a special way. And the outgoing particle will then be helium three. So instead, you start from hydrogen three and you get this decay and you get helium three where now you have two protons and a neutron. Helium three is stable, but uh, hydrogen three is uh, unstable. So N is a neutron. So P is proton, N is a neutron. And we're starting from hydrogen three, which is tritium gets its own special chemical symbol, and then it's going to decay into uh, helium-3. Now, they also don't use just uh, atomic uh, tritium. In fact, they use tritium-2, which is me molecular tritium. Now, that's not really important for our purposes, but that's what they actually use. So they have a tritium source. This is the reason that they did it in Karlsruhe, is because Karlsruhe is the thing that supplies the tritium that's what they do there. One of the things that they have is the facilities to work with tritium, to produce the tritium, to store it, to put it, have scientific investigations around tritium. Because uh, they use tritium in like ITER, the fusion reactor, stuff like that. So Karlsruhe had the tritium source and the tritium capabilities. And so that's why they're doing this experiment there because that's what you need. Okay, now what they're gonna do is they're gonna inject this tritium into this long lollipop thing. They accelerate it along this beam line right here. And eventually, um, the tritium, some of those tritium particles are going to decay. They're going to decay and produce a bunch of electrons. The amount of energy that comes off of the decay, that's what's important. What they're going to measure here is the energy of these electrons. So this electron right here that I'm circling, that we want to measure the energy of that particle. Why would we want to do that? Well, there's a good reason why we'd want to do that. Because the energy that comes off of the emission, or of this decay, so you have a tritium, uh, there we go. You have tritium uh, going into helium, and you get this electron and neutrino that come out. Okay? And they combined have some amount of energy that they can share amongst themselves. So when this decay happens, you convert. It turns out helium-3 is less massive than tritium, so you get plus some amount of energy that comes off of this. The amount of energy that you get is, I think it's like 18 electron volts, something like that. I don't, uh, I think that's what it is. It's a small, it's a relatively small number considering the mass of these things that are going in. So it's a small amount of energy that is just shared among the electrons and the neutrinos that come out. So if you want to constrain the Catron is designed to constrain or to measure the mass of the neutrino. If you want to measure the mass of the neutrino, but you can't capture the neutrino because neutrinos go through everything. Neutrinos pass through substances without stopping all the time. We mentioned already that um, a neutrino leaving the, the Earth and traveling to the next nearest star can go through two light years of lead without running into anything. All right, the, the chances are 50-50 in four light years that it, that it would hit something going directly through a lead bar. So neutrinos don't interact with very much. So when you produce the neutrino, 
you're not going to capture it in your spectrometer. What you can capture is the electron. So the electron is our handle on the neutrino. So the electrons are going to come out with some spectrum of energies. Sometimes the neutrino is going to get more kinetic energy. Sometimes the electron is going to get more kinetic energy. And so you can look at the energy spectrum from the electrons and see where it ends. You know what your budget is. Your budget is this, I think it's 18 electron volts. Your budget is 18 electron volts. So if you look at the spectrum of energy coming from, so this is the number, number, uh, this is not neutrinos anymore, it's the number, so I guess I'll do a cap, I'll, I'll do it like this. The number, the number of electrons, and this is the energy, the kinetic energy, so I'll do that a little bit differently as well, kinetic energy of the electron. So you're going to have some spectrum like this. Okay, and the maximum amount of energy that you can possibly have uh, coming off of this is going to be uh, right here. Okay, why is this not? Did I switch these? Draw. There we go. Right there. Okay, so this is going to be your... I. We'll, we'll, we'll keep going with 18 electron volts. Maybe we'll look it up at some point, but we'll keep going with the 18 electron volts and pretend that it's the right number. So this is the maximum amount of energy that the electron can have. That's basically in the rare decay where the electron gets all the kinetic energy and the neutrino gets little teeny kinetic energy, or basically no kinetic energy, is up here at the tail. So what you want to do then is zoom in right here at that tail. It's a relatively rare instance because typically they share the electron and the neutrino share the energy, so it's fairly rare to have the electron get all the energy and the neutrino get none. Um, but we like those ones. So you zoom in here, and what you'll end up with is the spectrum where there's no neutrino mass, where the lowest mass neutrino is zero, will end right there. Okay, That indicates that you can have instances where the electron gets all the available energy, all the available kinetic energy, right here, right, what the, I have no idea how this, okay, so, <laughs> my drawing pad skills are amazing, no, I don't want to save it, and that's not going to work, cancel, We'll pull it up again because I still have not figured out how that drawing pad, um, like what buttons I'm pushing that mess this up. So the kinetic energy is shared between the two. It's not exactly random that it's going to be shared between the two, but it is going to be shared between the two. But you, the point is that um, you can get some where the, almost all the energy goes into the electron, and that's what we're going for. All right, here we go. This time for sure, without the strange um, changes to my amazing drawing pad skills. Okay, so this was, I, I mentioned this is the number, and we're zooming in, we're, so we're zooming in, I'm, here's the big spectrum, we're gonna zoom in, here's the boundary, we're gonna zoom in on this. Okay, so here is this boundary at 18 electron volts. And we have, if the neutrino is massless, then it's gonna come in like that. Okay, so this is, the mass of the neutrino is equal to zero. If the neutrino has some mass, then there's a minimum amount of kinetic energy that the electrons can have because the neutrino mass has to take up some of this 18 electron volts. Their mass has to be conserved, or right? Energy has to be conserved in E equals MC squared. So in that case, what's gonna happen is it's gonna come in, this distribution is gonna come in and it's gonna land like this, okay? And this gap right here, that gap, again, this is energy on this axis, or energy on this axis. And so whatever this gap is, whatever the actual intersection point is and how much it differs from the possible intersection point, that is the mass of the neutrino. Okay? So that's what we wanna see, is where does this tail of the energy distribution of the electron end? Does it end at this point or somewhere shy of that point? And where, however precisely we can measure its intersection on this axis, 
is the precision with which we can measure the mass of the neutrino. And in fact, what you get is the mass of the thing that dominates the electron neutrino. So you have to do the statistics about what kind of neutrino is happening and, and so forth. Um, and, but it establishes, you know, you can use this to establish the total mass of the neutrinos and also determine which, what the hierarchy is between the two. So I'll show you what they would expect to find depending upon the hierarchy of the different masses in a moment. But this is the point that they want to measure. So how does one do this? Uh, the way that you do this is you send them these things, uh, the particles come along here, the, they decay, they produce these electrons of a variety of different types, and we know that the, um, most of them are going to have energies that we do not care about. We don't care about the big bump. We don't care about the neutrinos or the electrons that are up here. We only care about the electrons that are down here. And so we want to have very, very precise instruments, and so we don't want to blast our instruments with all of these things. We only want to uh, have a trickle of these particles coming in, like one out of every 100,000 or one out of every million um, electrons that are up here in this tail. And we want to eliminate all this stuff because if you have a very sensitive detector and you start blasting it with stuff, then you wear your detector out before you actually can make your measurement. So you want to remove all of these lower energy electrons and only allow the high energy electron to make it. And then you dial it, uh, you dial your filter so that um, only the highest energy stuff can make it through. Okay, so how do you do that? Well, through this pipe is a magnetic field. And when the magnetic field enters this chamber, the magnetic flux is conserved. The, you're conserving the a magnetic field times the area. So you increase the area, which means that the magnetic field needs to decrease. So the magnetic field comes in here and the magnetic field will spread out. Okay, and the density of magnetic field lines is what gives you the uh, the strength of the magnetic field. All right, so let me draw what this looks like. Here is the pipe. Here is the beginning of the mass spectrometer, like this. Pipes like this. There's a smaller spectrometer here that they use to like remove some things from it. I'm not exa exactly sure how that works. So you, you have a magnetic field coming through here. Here's all the magnetic field lines. And then the magnetic field is going to spread out like this when it gets in here. Okay, so the magnetic field in this area, the lines are dense, which means it's a large magnetic field. That's the, the way that these diagrams work when you're mapping out a magnetic field is that the density of the lines gives you the strength of the magnetic field. So you have a high magnetic field here in this pipe, and then the magnetic field dies down very quickly as it expands into this big blob of a, of a chamber. Okay, so what's gonna happen? Well, charged particles, like these electrons that are coming out, uh, they are going to be spiraling around the magnetic field lines because that's what charged particles do. You have a charged particle, you have a magnetic field, it's going to corkscrew around that. Okay, so here it is, it's going to be, the par charged particles are going to be corkscrewing around the magnetic field. When, they, when the magnetic field starts to die off, and it dies off in a smooth fashion, right? It's not like an abrupt transition where there's an abrupt end of the magnetic field. The magnetic field smoothly transitions into this uh, low magnetic field area. Um, it's impedance match. It's the same reason why a speaker, when you look at like the MASH episodes, they have these speakers that look like this. So the speaker looks like this so that you can have a, a high energy density oscillation over here and couple it to the low density atmosphere. Like you have to match the vibrations, the sound vibrations of this small uh, membrane to the atmosphere. You have to couple it effectively in order to allow the energy to escape readily. The same thing's going on here, basically, that you want to spread this out slowly. You want to expand the magnetic field slowly so that the um, you don't reflect, basically, the electrons um, off of some interface, uh, off of some abrupt transition. So the electrons are spiraling around the magnetic field. They enter into this thing, and now they have to conserve, you know, they have to conserve momentum and energy and angular momentum. And so what ends up happening is that um, the electrons are going to lose some speed as this magnetic field expands. This is, this is how it works. Uh, I just reviewed how this works. Yes, so uh, some of their spiraling energy is going to be converted into, um, like you're going to rotate some of their energy in, in a particular direction, so their momentum in a particular direction into a different direction is basically what it boils down to. Okay, so then what you do, now that the the particles are spreading out in this area, um, only 
the you then apply so here is the blob of the mass spectrometer well that's kind of an ugly blob let me try one more time here we go like that and this is probably going to be similarly ugly but that's a bit better okay so the magnetic field is spreading out in here and then you apply a voltage basically you have a battery volt across the spectrometer Okay, so you apply voltage, and what happens is that the low energy electrons are going to come spiraling into here, they're going to slow down, and you apply this voltage that is going to drive them away from the center. Okay, so an electron comes in, if it's got too low of energy, it's going to come in here, it's going to slow down, eventually it will stop, and the voltage is going to drive it back. Okay, too low energy is going to be driven back, too low energy is going to be driven back. However, you tune this voltage uh, to, you know, to some number, some value, and that will allow the, the electrons that come in with enough energy are going to be able to, even though they're spreading out, the electron coming in with enough energy, they make it across, and now it's going to be driven this way. And then it's going to come in, and then it will hit your detector. You put your detector on this side. So you tune it so that inside uh, this chamber, there is going to be a force pushing electrons away from the center. And so as they come in, if they come in with too low energy, they don't make it to the middle and they go back out, back out where they came from. And if they cross the threshold that you choose by having a dial, so your voltage will have a dial associated with it, um, that dial will allow only electrons of specific energies to make it through. Once they get over this hump, then they get accelerated the opposite direction and driven into your detector. And so by tuning this voltage, you can constrain how many electrons are there uh, that have energies above some given amount. Okay, so you tune your voltage to a given energy threshold, then you count the number of electrons that make it through. And you know how many electrons get rejected because of a variety of reasons, right? You know how fast you're injecting the tritium into the source, you know the lifetime of the tritium, you, you know how many come into the bottle. Uh, the question is how many make it to the other side, of, how many roll down the other side of the hill over here. So as you tune the voltage and you crank it up um, and reject more and more electrons, from the same energy spectrum, right? Because it's the same stuff coming in. You're just changing what the threshold is to let them pass all the way through uh, the volume of your spectrometer. Then you map out this tail of the energy spectrum. You're able to say, okay, when I set the threshold here, I get all of these electrons. When I set the threshold here, I get all of these electrons. When I set the threshold here, I get all of these electrons. And when I set the threshold here, I get no electrons, is basically the idea. Let me get out of the way. Get out of the way. So you get all the electrons that are above a given energy as you set the energy going across the spectrometer. So that is what's going on inside this chamber. Okay, and inside this spectrometer. Let's see. Um, was there something else? There was something else that I wanted to bring up. Must have been on here. Uh, we did that one already. Here's the Katrin experiment. Uh, I have some other things. All right, so here is from Wikipedia, everyone's favorite source of knowledge. This is a slightly better graphic of what I drew. Okay, looking at this tail down here. Uh, oh, it's keV. It's 18 keV, not elect, not regular electron volts. It's 18.6, 18.6 kilo electron volts, not just electron volts. So I got the 18 right. I was just off by a factor of a thousand. And a factor of a thousand, <laughs> yeah, that's nothing. A factor of a thousand is nothing. Um, all right, and they're looking at one electron volt. Right, they're looking at 18.599. Is their design goal for the first set of measurements was one electron volt, um, and this shows basically the difference. If the mass of the neutrino is one electron volt, then you get the red curve, which you can't see on the big one; it doesn't show up because it's at 0.01 or 0.1 percent, um, 0.01 percent, because it's from 10 to basically one, uh, 10,000 to one is 10 to four. Um, and then if the mass of the neutrino is 0.3 electron volts, then you get the green curve. Green curve that comes in right there. So it's got to be a third closer. Um, it's probably not quite a third closer. It's probably because you have to deal with the 
m squared. Uh, so you got to take a third and square it. So it's like 10, 10 times closer. Um, and then if the mass of the neutrino is zero, then you get the blue curve. So that gives you an idea of the sensitivity that they're pushing for. With their first set of measurements, they got basically one electron volt sensitivity. They're still operating. It was built in the, in the teens, the 20 teens, and is operating now. Uh, the expectation is, uh, from what I gathered in this Wikipedia article, is that their third, they're supposed to do like five runs, and that their fifth run uh, should, okay, Cal Karlsruhe tritium neutrino experiment, so I was right about that. The campaign, okay, so their first campaign was at 1.1 electron volts, which is basically one electron volt. Uh, their plan is to do uh, three more measuring campaigns, each comprising 65 days of active measurement, and they used comprising per correctly in this article. Good for them, using comprise properly. Uh, it needs 1,000 days of measurement to reach the target sensitivity of 0.2 eV. That will be the upper limit for the neutrino mass. So. Uh, final results are expected in five or six years, which would be like, you know, three or four years from now will be their final results. They may find a way to upgrade their instruments. It's kind of hard to upgrade it, right? Because you're limited by how much you can slow down. Um, there's a bunch of systematic effects. How much you can slow down the neutrino, the electrons as they come through, how precisely you can tune the voltage, how smooth the interior surfaces are, because that's going to affect the shape of the magnetic field. Uh, there's all sorts of stuff that go into, well, and how many cosmic rays and things like that are coming into your device. So there's a variety of uh, things that you have to contend with as you make these kinds of instruments, but getting down to 0.2 eV um, as an upper limit for the neutrino mass. So that is their design goal. Now, when they make this measurement, one of the things that's going to come up is the neutrino. Uh, let's see, I, I want to use this browser. Uh, neutrino mass hierarchy, spelled it wrong. And I didn't want scholarly articles. I wanted images. Okay, so they want to be able to do, um, so open this in a new tab, to tell which hierarchy they have. Do they have a normal hierarchy where, um, so this delta m squared solar and delta m squared atmosphere, that's the theta 2, 3, theta 1, 2. Um, so the atmosphere measured the theta 2, 3, or like the delta m squared 2, 3. Um, and delta m squared 1, 2 is from the solar neutrinos. That's from uh, the Sudbury Neutrino Observatory, where this was from Super Kamiokanda. And they don't know if it's uh, which one it is, if it's this kind of hierarchy or if it's this inverted hierarchy where theta atmosphere is that one and theta solar is this one. Okay, so Carl Katrin wants to be able to distinguish this, and they basically get right up to the point where they could almost make that measurement. So if we look at what they're expecting to do, a uh, new tab. Oh, this is a great image. That is not great enough. So we're going to go to a different, um, a different mass hierarchy, Katrin. So this is. what they're talking about. So here's Katrin. As Katrin continues to push their sensitivity uh, to the left here, so this is the mass of the neutrino in electron volts. Right now they are at one electron volt, basically, which is uh, right at the edge of the screen that you can't see. Uh, you can see the edge of the one. And their design sensitivity will get them down to this two, like 0.2 electron volts. That's their, this is where they think Katrin will end its data taking is at this point. Um, which is right before, well, it's a factor of 10, but it's right before the mass hierarchy would be distinguished, where you could tell. So if you have an inverted hierarchy, <coughs> excuse me, if you have it, the inverted hierarchy, then that implies that the largest mass neutrino is at the bottom. And that's why it uh, comes up here. So this is, um, for the inverted hierarchy, that's the easiest thing to find. If you have a normal hierarchy, then the mass of the neutrino could go all the way to zero. Um, so that is... Katrin would be right at the verge of being able to detect an inverted hierarchy, which could, you know, if they could get its sensitivity down by another factor of 10, which is a lot to ask, but it's plausible. If they could get their sensitivity down by another factor of 10, they could be able to tell us, they would be able to tell us if uh, the neutrinos have the inverted hierarchy or the normal hierarchy. 
Um, and that's you know one of the main pieces of the puzzle is if we do measure the masses, we get the mass scale, um, which one is it? Is it, how do they stack up? And if it's an inverted hierarchy, then that basically would be able to measure all the neutrino masses. You would get all the neutrino masses from it. Um, where instead, if it's the normal hierarchy, then you have to still go down until you can measure the, the smallest um, the smallest one. So that is what Catrin is designed to do. Uh, it's in the middle of doing this. It's already made its measurements. It's achieved the design goal for the amount of data they've taken. It seems to be functioning correctly. And that will be solving this mystery of the universe. Uh, related to this is, and this will be for a different time, is there are other experiments that are specifically designed to, um, let's see what this image says. Okay, so here's Catron sensitivity. Catron sensitivity here. The Planck bound, that's what I mentioned with cosmology, that you can constrain the mass of the neutrinos by looking at how the physics of the early universe behaves. So the Planck bound and the Catron sensitivity are kind of right next to each other. Cosmological measurements have their own set of systematic effects that you have to worry about. Um, you can't control it quite as well as Catron is able to measure. Uh, and then you have this, um, this mass on the, on the side, which is uh, the mass of the neutrino from the double beta decay measurements. Uh, and that's a that's a stream for a different time. That's something I'm looking forward to, talking about the double beta decay, excuse me, the double beta decay experiments, um, because that's uh, that's a really cool experiment. Um, anyway, so excluded by CAM, lands N, Gerda, XO3, Quare, these are all neutrino experiments. So we're really narrowing down to where the neutrinos can live, where the masses of the neutrinos actually are. And the sensitiv sensitivity goal of the next generation of experiments will be able to tell us if we have a normal hierarchy or an inverted hierarchy, they'll actually be able to um, drop down below this band where the signal would be if you had an inverted hierarchy. And that will be a major breakthrough, right? It, it gets us a factor of 10 closer to actually measuring the mass of the neutrino, and it also eliminates one of the possible hierarchies, so we know um, what order the neutrino masses come in. So that is pretty cool. So any questions on the Catron experiment? Um, I'll do my best to answer them. In the meantime, as I answer those amazing questions, we will put, we'll put this picture up there so that we can all bask in the glory of modern science. <laughs>